not expected to go first, but uh, here I am. So, there's a couple of rules, though. I uh, meet your sympathy tonight, because you heard us from Colorado, and my Broncos didn't do too well. <laughs> 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 the other thing is, you heard my name was uh, Edward Ford, but uh, all my friends uh, call me Jerry, so I can see my friends, but please call me Jerry. It's a good name. If you have my back words to talk to me, I'll, I'll tell you the story. I'm going to get into it. It's a long time ago. Mr. Gary, pull the mic up just a bit. Okay, okay. pull the mic up just a bit. Thank you so much. Good friend. Okay. There you go. Okay, how's this? That's Good great. Yeah. Yay! All right. Uh, that's right, you can, you can learn a little bit. Okay. Um, First, I'd like to say it's an honor to be here and be asked to uh, this be a great tonight. Uh, I like to think of Mary Bailey who came here and asked me to come. So my trepidation comes because I spent 25 years just doing this. I don't know much else. But before that, I was the uh, military brat from Ponce and Army. That's all I know. This is my first outing. Uh, the base let me out. I got permission from my boss to come out here and speak to you all. And I'm really glad to come. So I have a lot to tell you. Um, I'll try to ramble on too much, so I'll prepare my remarks and kind of like keep, it, keep it kind of short. Uh, so, this talk tonight, if nothing else, it should be uh, interesting and not entertaining. So, uh, I can make it happen. So, first, I'd like to uh, congratulate all the nominees and the winners for the George Brown House. Uh, that was a great job. Um, so, tonight I was asked to talk about the presence of the Air Force Base and the far reaching influence on the uh, economic growth of Lake Park. And to address how moving has an effect on those who work with it. Now, okay, I'd like to speak too briefly on this. However, I'd like to focus my talk on, on two things this evening. Uh, the first is to give you a little history of moving, our mission, economic impact, and community in which we all live. Secondly, I'd like to present my view from a military perspective on those who create their own businesses. And up front, I believe there's a symbiotic relationship between entrepreneurs and the military, which I think is all of our discussion this evening. So before I begin, I uh, express my sincere appreciation from the Airmen and families of Moody for the hospitality and support uh, from the surrounding communities. It's undoubtedly the best uh, in the Air Force. In my 25 years, I'm also so handsome. This has been the best support I've ever received. Uh, and it feels like home to me. That's why I feel so comfortable here tonight. I don't have to use any of my speaker's trick, you know, kind of imagine you guys, you know, in your skinnies. But I will imagine you guys uh, with uniforms on. That makes me a little comfortable, okay? Some of you guys can get that, so I guarantee you. Okay. <laughs> but it is the best here. It is the best I've ever seen. I've been to a lot of places. Uh, I've moved about, uh, about 13, 14 times in my career. I've lived in every part of this country. Uh, but this is kind of, this feels like home. Uh, so, and my participation here in the award ceremony is just one more shiny example of the close relationships that Moody Air Force Base enjoys with our civilian partners. So this unprecedented relationship is not a surprise to the history of Moody. So without the support of the community, Moody would not even exist today. And in fact, the base had its beginnings in 1940 when a group of citizens from the local community began to search for ways to assist the expanding defense program. So in October 1940, then the committee invited the Army Air Corps to consider the Valdosta area. So the Air Corps found a successful site about 11 and a half miles north northeast of, uh, of Valdosta, a little settlement that I think is now called Demas, so it's called Highway Demas. Um, and so on May 14, 1941, the Board of Farmer was granted exclusive use of the land by the United States Department of Agriculture for this time. And so Valdosta Airfield, as it was originally named, Opened officially in September 1941. It was later renamed Moody Army Airfield in honor of, uh, later renamed Moody Army Airfield in honor of Major George Putnam Moody. Uh, he perished in an aircraft testing accident in Wichita, Kansas, on May 5th, 1941. Uh, so today, the current mission of Moody, and for those of you who have ever seen Moody Air Force Base, you're right, you kind of know our aircraft that are out there. Uh, today, the planes are being organized, trained. Employees, combat ready, A 10s, so they're attack aircraft, HC 130s are fixed uh, aircraft, HH 60s are helicopters, Harris is <laughs> protection assets, and personnel consisting of approximately 500 military and civilian personnel. 
So our main missions at Air Moody Air Force Base are post air support, force protection and rescue, uh, to include combat search and rescue, and personal recovery. Okay, so what does that mean in uh, layman's terms? Okay, first we do post air support. And for those who see those are the great, the great planes, the small the big engines on them. Uh, what they really are is a gas and gun with wings on. Uh, the most powerful piece of that is the gun on the front. Uh, and so we tell you the folks in uh, Afghanistan that, that aren't our friends, they see that thing coming. It fires uh, 30 millimeter rounds, huge, uh, huge rounds. The thing that's most interesting about it is when that gun is fully spun up, it will fire 35, 30 millimeter rounds a second. So, very powerful machine. So much so that it actually slows the airplane down when it's firing a little bit. So, very powerful weapon. Combat rescue, I like to refer to that as uh, flight and flight machine guns. So they go to some very dangerous areas to pick up our soldiers who are moving in combat. Uh, very, very brave men and women doing those missions. And of course, we have another wing on there, uh, 938 gallon air ground operations wing in the Air Force Base. And they do base defense. So there are a lot of cops there who uh, defend the folks who defend America. Uh, very brave men and women there too. They also have tactical air controllers who are embedded with the Army and fall in those close air, uh, air strikes. And sometimes, just so you know, those air strikes are all within 50 yards of our troops down range. And so that's a procedure, that's some training so you can be proud of the folks that are here for the first place and talk to us in America. So, and this is just a key factor that my boss brought up the other day, I did realize this, that I'm not sure that you all really appreciate this, is that the men and women of have been at war every day 365 days a year since late 2009. Every day. We have men and women in combat today, tonight, as we sit here in the Georgia Hill and honor our war workers. So that's a key factor. Every day, your men and women, your neighbors, have been in combat since 2009. Okay. So, as far as the economic impact in the community, I believe Moody's impact is fairly significant. So I'll just talk about just a few numbers, but again, as I said, that's not my real purpose here tonight. I really want to put it back around and let you know how we feel about you. Because so, you often honor us so much, so often, uh, that you really, I think, hear how we feel about you. Uh, so that would be really the crux of my uh, discussion here tonight. So according to a recent economic impact study, Woody is the largest employer in the county. It has a direct monetary impact of $440 million in the local area. With our kids in school, we have a 30,000 economic impact aid to local schools. We also have over 10,000 active duty military civilians and dependents with a combined spending power of over $300 million a year. Military construction, $22 million. Contract expenditures, $86 million. And value of job creation is $60 million. And I will tell you most of those contracts, and I'm going to talk about that tonight in your discussion. Uh, most of those contracts who do work on our base come right from local community. So we like to award it to small businesses and uh, for folks to work here. Uh, so that's certainly a major impact. So you have to pay attention to this part. It's pretty little dicey. Uh, it's simply my attempt to explain how we in the military view you as business owners and why. And as I said, the least amount of impact uh, is important. The primary reason I was very honored and excited to speak with you tonight is because I wanted the opportunity to express my appreciation to you all. And I don't think it's a far stretch to say that our country is great as it is because of one of the citizens like you. And as I said earlier, I've been in the military for nearly 25 years and have always been proud to serve and defend our nation. And so during this time, I've had many wonderful experiences and have been educated in many things. And in the military, we're taught early that we're here to defend America and our way of life. And while that statement sounds good, it isn't until we get more senior and rank, like an old man like me, that we really begin to understand what that means in tangible <coughs> terms. For instance, we're trained and challenged to answer questions like, what exactly is our way of life? Where does our source of power come from? And what threats are we defending it from? And most importantly, how do we defend it? In addressing the first two questions, I will submit to you that our way of life could best be uh, described in terms of our strong and unwavering belief in individual freedom. But freedom to choose our own destiny and to reap the benefits of one's own efforts. 
Many describe this as American capitalism, which is a theory that basically says that the United States is qualitatively different from other nations because of the weekly American ideology of Americanism, which is based on concepts such as liberty, equality, individualism, and multiple traits. So in essence, our strength as a nation comes from individuals who exercise their right to pursue their own goals and desires. These individuals value independence, self-reliance, and it's my firm belief that it's individuals who possess the entrepreneurial spirit typifies the, uh, this idea of individualism. I think it's fair to say that you all in this room tonight are the foundation of America's strength and personify the core principle of individual freedom that we all hold dear as Americans. You are the ones who often risk everything to pursue your dreams, and in this case, your dreams manifest themselves in businesses which in turn spur economic growth the cornerstone of our nation's power. Moreover, you all share a collection of admirable traits such as tenacity, the risk tolerance, curiosity, and innovation, self-discipline, perseverance, persistence, determination, commitment, motivation. It's commonly assumed that successful entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and business owners are driven by money. I, for one, do not concur with this premise. I believe individuals with the traits I just described are driven by a passion for their product, service, or trade. Individuals such as you believe also they can change the world. And I believe you all have. With the power of imagination and drive, entrepreneurs, business owners, and supporters did change our world and expand our economy into the global world. And for the military, protecting the global economy is a national priority. As some of you may already know, our overarching defense strategy has its beginnings in a document called the National Security Strategy, which is crafted by the President of the United States. And every president, from President Reagan to President Obama, has listed two things. One, the survival of the United States, and recently the security of U.S. citizens as a top priority. And number two, a strong, innovative, healthy, growing economy as a second. So those two things set off our defense strategy. Those two things we work to defend. So this is where I think the symbiotic link between those who help grow our economy and those of us who defend it. So now the question becomes, how does the military go about defending the global economy? So it may surprise me to know that the U.S. Department of Defense spends a great deal of time and money and training in senior leaders to understand not only the art of war, but to also understand those tangible things that make our country strong in the national and the global environment that we must operate in. But this understanding of military leaders can form a base upon which to answer the questions I just posed. And I was fortunate enough to be selected to attend the Army War College in Carl, Pennsylvania. At the War College, they focused on teaching us many things, but interestingly enough, they educated us on intergovernmental and multinational environments. The curriculum focuses on the characteristics of the performance suspected of us at senior levels. We studied higher levels of national policy and strategy. We also got to analyze the relationship between the military force and national political objectives. All of this to help us understand the place of the U.S. military and U.S. national strategy. At the end, we developed our own theoretical, conceptual, and intellectual perspective so that we would have tools to address the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environments that we would return to. With respect to the global economy, we came to understand that in preserving the American way of life, it's necessary to maintain the state of the trade environment. And any shock to the global economy, whether it be from regional conflict, terrorist attacks, natural disasters, war, they all have the potential, they all have the potential global impact and thus threaten our national interests. So when some military leaders are taught to look at the world in terms of potential threats and vulnerabilities, I for one was shocked at how fragile our global economy really is, and that it takes constant care to ensure its stability. I think one key thing I learned, which I'll share with you tonight, is that there are some things that we rely on daily and may take for granted their availability. For instance, goods that traverse on key maritime trade routes are extremely vulnerable to disruption. So I was surprised to learn that the vast majority of the world's goods and oil transit through four major maritime choke points 
And many of these choke points are next to politically unstable countries, which increases the risk of compromise to their access to the region. And then the, the Panama Canal, the Suez Canal, the Straits of Malacca, and the Straits of Hormuz are the world's four most important strategic maritime countries, and most not in friendly neighborhoods. For example, the Straits of Hormuz, located between Oman and Iran, has a daily oil toll of roughly 35% of all seaborne traded in the world, almost 20% of the oil traded worldwide. Some say that Hormuz represents the most important strategic passage in the world, solely because of its access to the oil fields in the Middle East and through the Persian Gulf. And we are all aware of the volatility in this region. All say from a defense point of view, we must constantly be aware of threats to the global economy and have the ability to address those threats as they could negatively impact our national interests. And although I spoke in global terms, we understand that global issues can have local impacts. Again, this is why I appreciate you so much. America is what it is because of your courage, not mine, not ours, your courage. So tonight, it was my pleasure to speak with you. My purpose was to simply honor what you do, not only for the local community, but for our country. I'm personally impressed by the tenacity and boldness of entrepreneurial and business-minded people such as you. If you weren't out there creating, producing, developing, and innovating, we wouldn't be the greatest schools in the world, nor the leaders of all three nations in the world. That said, there is no doubt that the presence of Louis has a direct impact on the local community and the economy. However, the local impact, or the impact the local community has on Louis is much, much greater. While we're both here together locally and have strong mutual beneficial relationships, our purpose is much larger, more magnificent, and more important than perhaps any of us can imagine. So thank you for listening, and may God bless you, and may God bless my sister.